Right, very, very interesting story there. And I believe it's, it's okay as a child if you bed wet, but uh, if you go past a certain age, then it becomes problematic. I remember I was a, a bed wetter past a certain age, and those are not very fun memories. I won't even go there. But as an adult, it becomes a huge problem, doesn't it? Dr. Obey joins me this morning. Um, he's resident in psychiatry at the Pantine Hospital, and he shed some more light on enuresis. Did I get that right? Yes, enuresis. enuresis. Right. So what, what exactly or what causes bedwetting? Oh, um, first of all, the thing that we need to keep in mind is that um, bedwetting, like um, your, uh, the first person said, um, it's normal uh, in children. Um, usually, most of them will gain uh, control of, of, of it by four years old. So we take interest in it um, clinically at the age of five. So by five years old, if you haven't stopped uh, wetting yeah, the bed, we expect most, it's most a children, uh -huh, most children, to have uh, gained have control, control of by their five. bladder. Yes. <laughs> okay. By five. And, and then the next thing to worry about is the frequency. So um, there are lots of lots of causes of bedwetting, but um, the most common uh, we we see is um, problems with the way the child um, eats or drinks. So uh, typically, a lot of the children don't drink a lot um, in the morning when they wake up, and then when they go to school, they are too busy to drink, so they come home very thirsty. No, so, so they drink all the fluids later yeah, on in the day. Most of their day's fluids are taken at night. And then this predisposes them to having a lot of urine produced at night. Mm. Uh, another thing that's not helpful is um, eating heavy, heavily in the late hours of the day. Um, when you eat, um, the nutrients are taken out of your food in your gut. But not all of them are useful. And some of them, you take too much of them um, out of the food. So um, these are filtered out through your kidneys. Now, in order to get the excess nutrients and the waste nutrients out of your body, the kidney is going to use water to do that. So the more waste you have in your system, the more water you need to flush it out. So you eat a lot in the evening, so a you lot more goes into your kidneys, and then your kidneys use a lot more water to get it out, and you end up with a lot more um, urine in, in you than um, would be um, helpful otherwise. Right. And... Um, for some children, too, there's a, this chronic constipation. Not necessarily difficulty passing stools, but some people don't go for two to um, three days. Some people have very, very hard stools. And um, the pelvis, the bony structure in which houses your rectum, uh, where you store your stool, and your uh, bladder where you store the urine, it's not that roomy. So if one is um, hoarding a lot of stuff, it's going to compress the other so that you can't um, hold as much urine in it overnight, oh. so you're more likely to let it go. Let it go at night. Um, okay, so we understand all of this, having to let go and all of that. But what causes people to not be able to wake up wake and up. let it go? That's the second half of the puzzle. Um, it's been found that people who suffer from enuresis, they sleep deeper than other people so they are less likely to wake up to sounds and um, several other triggers that would wake them up so it's more difficult to wake these children up than other children um, we're not exactly sure what the causes of this um, sleeping deeper but an interesting thing is that for the people who have a primary problem that the, the bedwetting is the only problem there's a high um, correlation with family members so you have a parent one parent ah, or the other, hereditary. some of it. Okay. So one parent or the other who's also had suffered from this um, condition. Ah. Yeah. I should have blamed one of my parents during <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger and bed wetting and they were giving me so much grief. I should have said, one of you must have been doing it. That's uh -huh. why I'm doing it. The interesting thing about the grief is um, it's very common for children with bed wetting to have low self-esteem. Um, they feel sad a lot of time. They have... Uh, because it's embarrassing. Yeah, no Precisely, and people make fun of them. But um, for people who develop bedwetting later, we as psychiatrists were concerned that some of these children might be processing something um, in, a, in an un unhealthy way, which might be causing the bedwetting. Could be something as simple as the birth of a new child and therefore loss of attention, um, going into a new school, parents divorcing. But it, bec it could be something more malicious, like the child is being abused. Or bullied or... Yeah, or molested by okay. a parent or an uncle or a teacher or something. So it's possible for 
uh, it's not common that this is the cause of the bedwetting, but for a child who was dry and then now has become wet, it's a possibility. It's okay. a remote possibility. So for, for the adults who bedwet, is it that um, they develop it at uh, a later time in life or is that they were never able to quit as, as children? Good. It can be either or. Um, it could be that, uh, like your um, thing uh, showed, 2% um, by 18 still haven't gained um, dryness. So it could be something that continued or it could be something that started um, in, late, in late life. Uh, when it starts in late life, you really want to look at what medications the person, the person is taking because some medications can uh, predispose you to bedwetting. So if you are an adult and you started bedwetting, you should go and see um, whatever doctor prescribed whatever medication you're on and discuss whether that particular medication can so cause So you're saying that bedwetting. sometimes for adult bedwetters it could be due to um, certain medication that you're side taking? side effect of a medication, yeah. Okay, that's a good excuse. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful excuse. <laughs> okay, what um, else? There could also be an infection in the bladder which is um, reducing its ability to retain urine in it for a long time because it becomes more sensitive when it's infected. So a little bit of urine, it gets irritated and then it immediately voids. Yeah. Okay. Is this a medical condition? Is this a disease or something? Or is it just, just sheer laziness? It's a condition. Like I said, um, so these it's just, people... it's an illness? Yes. Yeah, these people sleep deeper than other people and produce a lot of urine at night. So it's something, it's a disorder that, can, that should be managed. Because, if nothing else, because of the psychological torment that the child goes through, from bullying from other children and all of that. And then such a person, if it persists till the time he has to go to boarding school, he's not going to have a very pleasant um, life time in boarding, in boarding yeah. school. And that could affect his academic uh, performance, which could affect his could future affect life performance. Life. Precisely. So we treat anything that can have that sort of a psychological impact very seriously. So should we do away with that notion that it's just uh, sheer laziness, that people are lazy, they just yeah, can't it's, wake up? Yeah, it's, it's almost it's never more serious la- than laziness, that. yes. Okay, but how, how does it happen, though? Because, I mean, when you're not sleeping, when you're fully awake and yeah. you, um, you have the urge to, to pee, you have the urge to go, you feel it. Yeah. So what happens um, during sleep that you're not able to... The normal thing that happens, normal thing that happens when your bladder gets full, it sends a message. To even when brain. you're asleep, it sends a message to your brain. Your brain, there's a certain part of your brain, there are parts of your brain that regulate you being awake and regulate you being asleep. Right. So when that message gets to the brain, the part that regulates your sleep goes down for most people, and the part that wakes you up goes up. up allowing you to wake up and go and urinate. Right. However, in these people, because they're sleeping so deep, deep. They, that mechanism doesn't happen. It doesn't work. So they just continue to sleep and then they void peacefully. I've heard um, stories where some people, I, I think it's actually even happened to me once, some people feel like they're in water, either you're swimming or you're actually on the toilet seat yes. and you feel like you're, you're actually in the to- you're peeing. very nice dream. Yeah, but you're actually <laughs> sleeping. Uh, how, how does yeah. that happen? It's like you're dreaming, kind of. You feel like you're <laughs> doing the right thing, but you're actually in bed, you're sleeping. The brain is a wonderful thing. It just, it interprets uh, different signals in different ways in different people. So, it's getting this information and then it does what it's going to do with it. Uh, some people, there are some theories about dreaming that you plan what you're going to do. If you've been thinking about something yeah. a lot, you plan what you're going to do the next day. It's an opportunity to plan out your life. So if the information that your brain is getting at that point in time by that theory is that you are going to urinate, then the, bra- the brain will plan through going to urinate. So walk you to the uh, bathroom, open but the door. But your doors. brain is actually <laughs> deceiving you. Yes, yes. That's because your brain can function. It functions normally. It's just... Essentially, when you're asleep, you are paralyzed. So your brain can go through all the normal motions. It just won't affect your muscles. So in your brain, you're, you're doing the walking. It's just that you're not walking. So people with sleepwalking, that paralysis doesn't happen. So that's why they are actually able to get up and walk to the bathroom. So the brain is just running through this process. You're paralyzed. And then it, it, the brain has reached the, the bathroom. So it's done what it needs to do. And now it's urinating. And you just happen to still be on your bed. Wow. Is this very common in Ghana? I mean, do we, um, do we see adults reporting to hospitals and clinics with this, with adults, this condition? Adults, not so much. But children children and adolescents, yes, we see, we see quite a few. We don't have exact statistics, but we do treat it 
um, a bit at the at the hospital. And it's treatable, or is it just manageable? It's is it something that can go away completely? Most most of the causes will stop by themselves. Like uh, your your thing was showing, most of them uh, by the by late teens, at, um, you should most people have gained dryness. So it's it's we manage it in the interim whilst. Um, whilst it's going to stop by itself. And some people do stop as a result of the management. There are some people who are, who are married or who are in relationships who experience this. I mean, what should they do? Well, they should come in so that we, we have a talk, to them, talk with them and find out what exactly the cause of their problem is. If it's from childhood, then we know um, okay. the measures that we... And when they're adults, it's easier to treat because... Motivation is a big part of the treatment um, for when you're doing the behavior change. Because you're dealing with a six, seven-year-old, he doesn't really understand what's going on. So the older the person is, it's it's easier, it's easier to treat because the person can play a more uh, more pivotal role in the in the treatment. So if it's from childhood, we have uh, ways to help. The person might not know that it's possible to treat and has been living with it um, all his life, just buying a whole lot of bed sheets. <laughs> <laughs> which he can change frequently. But um, if it's something that started later, then we do have to investigate and find out what has gone wrong and why it started. Mm. Well, what is the treatment exactly? What, what do you, uh, how do you treat it? There are it pills that you take or? There are three things. First of all, like I said with the children, um, there's, there's a lot of them that just drink a lot and eat a lot in the evening. So you so, cut down on that. So you make sure that they hydrate well during the day. Okay. And then you make sure that they urinate several times, at least two to three times. Sometimes they need a note to the teacher saying that this child has this problem, therefore he needs to urinate. So anytime he wants to urinate, don't keep him in class. So we're not done yet, that sort of thing. Um, also, we monitor um, the meals that they take. Uh, if this is not, um, is not helpful, then we go on to their two main uh, modes of treatment after that point. There's what we call alarm therapy. So, but we don't, we don't, we don't, it's not widely available in Ghana. There's an alarm um, placed uh, near the area that's most likely to be wet when the patient is going to wet him, him or herself. Okay. Um, initially, the alarm was um, attached to something that would give a mild electric shock. So, you'd, you, well, you'd wet yourself and then it would shock you so that you'd wake up and Ooh. stop. <laughs> yes. But I think now... That's, a, that's a serious. Well, it's it? a, a serious shock. form of <laughs> it's a mild treatment. Shock. No, um, now it's, it's wired to an alarm. And the alarm has to be in a place that the parents can hear because obviously the child is having difficulty waking up anyway. Right. So the child, if it's not going to wake up to the urine, is not likely to wake up to the alarm. So the alarm wakes the parents up and then parents come to, to wake, you wake up. the child up. But you would up. have been shocked by then. No, no, no. There's no shock anymore. It's oh, just the okay. alarm. <laughs> it's just That's the alarm. kind of extreme. It's just the alarm. So okay. um, we're doing that usually in a month, three months, that uh, most children stop bedwetting with this technique. Uh, we also have certain medications that are able to um, delay the process or stop the process so that the child doesn't bedwet. Mm. So we have medications and then we have the alarm therapy. Those are the main the main uh, ways okay. of So I guess the most important thing that we should know is that it is a condition, it's a disorder, it's not um, due to laziness or anything, because I know in some communities or societies, I mean, they put the children through so much, yes. you know, they wrap them in the, the wet clothes and they, you know, and they, they laugh and they mock them, they parade them on the streets and so on and so forth. Uh, it's likely so to that's make not them the best. continue doing that because, like I said, psychological trauma can lead to bedwetting. So if you're, you're traumatizing the child for bedwetting, then you're just making the situation worse. So that's a wrong way to go about yes. it. Yes. So the best thing is to, is to get treatment. Well, the first thing I, I would advise, so that we don't, we're not inundating with too many people at the hospital, that um, first watch the time the, per the child is eating, watch the, child the, time, the time the child is drinking, make sure the child drinks well during the day and urinates enough time during the day and doesn't eat very heavy at night. Do that for a month to three months. After that, if it's not working, then you should come in and then let's see what we can do for you. All right. Thank you so much for shedding more light on this issue with us um, this morning. Dr. Kojo Obeng is a resident in psychiatry at the Pantang Hospital, and you heard him say it all. Um, it is a medical condition. So um, if you're an adult and you're bedwetting, um, your partner or the people around you should know that it's not due to laziness or any of any such thing. Let's give them all the support that they require.